as they release more and newer decisions, these new decisions release everything. They will say Weston Powell, landlord, and Matt McKeever, tenant. A relatively new thing because of COVID is you have to try to work out a payment arrangement with your tenant. This wasn't always the case, it is now, and it's largely because of COVID, probably for the foreseeable future, um, you can enforce your eviction orders. So you actually can go to the sheriff's office and have them come out to the property and, and remove people. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here, and we're back with Weston Powell. And I'm excited today because we're gonna be talking about evictions and rent control, particularly rent control and evictions around non-payment of rent, because that can actually become a whole ball of wax, I'm sure that we can probably cover in future videos in regards to other subject matters. But before we jump into it, Weston, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks, man. How are you doing? Doing good. And it's good just to have you back on the uh, channel. I know that people really enjoyed getting your perspective in regards to, uh, you know, small claims court and all that, because again, it's an area that's important for us to be aware of. But it's one of the areas also that you kind of hope you never have to really learn about. And I think that that's the case with a lot of landlords when it comes to both understanding rent control here in Ontario, as well as then eviction and what happens when tenants stop paying you rent. I think that unfortunately, a lot of landlords kind of naively when they get started, just cross their fingers and like close their eyes and hope that if they, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, that nothing bad will happen. But I think it's actually probably important that we understand what we're getting into before becoming a landlord if possible. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got a little presentation prepared. I guess I can pull it up for you. Yeah, let's do it. And so I guess just as you're pulling up the presentation, as far as like, you know, your business and your day to day, do you, yeah. are you involved in this a lot, Weston? And like what percentage or like when do people decide to really like pull you in? Yeah, sadly, they try to pull me in um, at the end when they're about to have their hearing. And that's great. It's, it's better than nothing. But um, sometimes they've made fatal errors in their application materials and in their notices. And if that's the case, I might show up to a hearing only to be heard, only to be told rather, um, that yeah, there's this fatal flaw in the document, start all over, see you again in eight months. Uh, gotcha. Like incredibly frustrating for, for clients and, uh, and for myself as well. So ideally people would reach out as soon as they have a tenant not paying their rent. Um, towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk to you about sort of costs involved and timelines and whether or not you should even have a lawyer or paralegal. I'm so happy to kind of dive a little deeper into that later on. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get into it. Okay. Um, so, oh yeah, mandatory lawyer joke. Um, what's the joke today? So you'll appreciate this as a former accountant. Um, what's the difference between an accountant and a lawyer? I'm not sure. Accountants know they're boring. Yeah, I would say that that actually that sticks for me. Um, definitely, there's a lot of self-deprecating humor amongst accountants in that regard. So, yeah, lawyers take themselves too seriously. <laughs> um, okay, so things that we're going to cover today: um, most common uh, landlord misunderstandings. So, yeah, rent control. Um, what rent control is? When it applies? How much can you raise the rent? When can you raise the rent? How often can you raise the rent? Everything having to do with that, we'll talk about. And um, evictions, specifically, we're just going to focus on evictions for non-payment of rent because there's a bunch of other reasons like consistent or chronic late payment of rent. That's another reason why you could evict. But for today's purposes, we'll just narrow our focus on uh, non-payment of rent. And then instead of collecting unpaid rent, we're not actually going to talk about that. That's a typo. That can be a uh, subject maybe of uh, another day. So... Oh yeah, bonus tip, before we even dive into the presentation, this is hot off the presses, exciting stuff, uh, at least in my world. So um, some of your audience may be familiar with Canly, this uh, website here. It's free, it's available to the public, and it's a great way to look at past decisions from the landlord tenant board. So you know, if you've got a hearing coming up, it's always a good idea to see how decisions are reached and mm -hmm. what kind of you know, reasoning they're using in their decisions. And it was, it was always useful for that purpose. But now, just in the last couple of weeks, um, something's I was changed. Say, I thought this just came out. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really exciting where formerly, you know, they've got decisions going back years and years, but all those decisions would say, you know, JD landlord and SD tenant. So they'd use their, um, their initials rather than their full name. So, you know, it, I guess it helps protect you know, your identity or something like that. 
um, but incredibly frustrating for landlords looking at prospective tenants because I want to know, I don't care if SD has been to the landlord tenant board 10 times. I want to know if my prospective tenant has been to the landlord tenant board mm-hmm. 10 times. And so what's happened just in the last couple of weeks, as they release more and newer decisions, these new decisions release everything. They will say Weston Powell landlord and Matt McKeever tenant mm-hmm. um, rather than, you know, MM tenant. Um, so this is one more due diligence that your audience can do when they're screening their tenants, their perspective. You can go to the website, search for their name and see, have they recently been to the LTB for any reason at all? You can just search by their name. So great resource. Um, I should say though, that this is brand new and not every decision, um, not every case rather at the LTB is published as a decision. So just because you go to this website and search for your prospective tenant's name and it doesn't come back, that doesn't necessarily mean they haven't been to the LTB. It just means that they haven't published a decision with that person's name. Still useful, um, but it's not a guarantee that they haven't been in trouble with the LTB before. Right. Yeah, that's important to understand. It's not a comprehensive list. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they tend to um, write sort of the interesting ones. So if there were professional tenants and things like that, those would be yeah, the ones yeah. that tend to get published. So still a very valuable resource and something that I'll use mm-hmm. in my uh, process moving forward. So turning to rent control, um, rent control, just what it is, um, it's a limit on the amount that you can raise the rent every year. So in the province of Ontario, we do have rent control. And what it means is that rather than being able to raise the rent to whatever you want, you can only raise it um, in accordance with a guideline that's published every year. And so normally, that guideline rate, it, it varies every year, but normally it's one and a half to a maximum of two and a half percent. And the idea is it's supposed to keep pace with inflation. That's mm-hmm. obviously not going to be the case moving forward as we enter sort of hyperinflation, but um, that's how it usually works. There was a rent freeze this year, meaning you can't raise the rent um, in, in this year, but they just published the rate for next year. So next year you will be able to raise the rent. Uh, you'll be able to raise it by 1.2%, which is fairly paltry figure, mm-hmm. um, but you can raise it by 1.2%. So if you had rent of $1,000, for example, you could raise the rent by 1.2% and now charge $1,012. Um, so that's what rent control is. It's basically a limit on how much you can raise the rent. And it's in accordance with that guideline that's published every year. And uh, in order to raise the rent, you've got to give 90 days notice to your tenants and um, so if you plan on raising the rent next year, make sure that you give your tenant at least 90 days notice, uh, written notice. When does rent control apply? The vast majority of the housing stock mm-hmm. in Ontario is covered by rent control, but there is an exception. Um, if the unit was first occupied after November 15th, 2018, then rent control doesn't actually apply. The idea was it was an incentive to create new housing stock. Um, mm-hmm. We have a you know a housing supply shortage in Ontario, and so the government thought, okay, well, in order to incentivize new builds and renovations, so for example, turning a basement into a full unit, um, we can encourage that by saying, if you do that, there is no rent control. You can raise the rent to whatever you want. Um, importantly, though, so let's say that you bought a brand new condo, it was built last year. Um, rent control doesn't apply to that unit. However, you can still only raise the rent once per year. So if your tenant comes in, signs a one-year lease, at the end of that lease, you could raise the rent theoretically to whatever you want, really whatever the market will bear, which is great. Um, But once you do that, you can't a month later try to raise the rent again. You'd have to wait another full year before you could raise the rent. So even on newer um, units um, where you can raise the rent essentially to whatever you want, you can only do it once per year. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And really appreciate that. Because I know there's a lot of people in the last few years that have, uh, you know, created income suites or basement apartments, and oftentimes, they're not aware of uh, the implications there. And obviously, at, from a landlord, just a business perspective, in theory, you know, a unit created after November 15th, 2018, sounds a lot more attractive to owning than a unit owned, like created before then. So yeah, 100%. And it's so important now. So we're kind of coming out of it now, but there was a time um, recently where certain parts of Toronto, for example, rent rates, rental rates dropped by like 40%, which Mm -hmm. is remarkable, right? And so if 
you got a new tenant in and you had to slash the rent by 40% to otherwise, you know, it would potentially be vacant. If you did that and you can only raise the rent by one or 2% per year, it's going to be a decade before you can get back yeah. to where it should be. Right. So um, something to bear in mind. And so that kind of leads me actually to the next point, which is the importance of raising the rent every year. And so a lot of people kind of have the belief that, oh, I've got great tenants. They don't cause any problems. They never give me any grief. I'm not going to raise the rent um, just out of a courtesy to them because I, I enjoy having them as, as clients. Nice, nice theory, nice thing to do. Um, Business-wise, return on investment-wise, not a great idea, only because I have people, for example, who call me after 10 years of never raising the rent. And they say, you know, I haven't mm -hmm. raised the rent in 10 years, so I'd like to, I'd like to double it. <laughs> And I say, well, you can't, uh, there's no retroactive increases. It doesn't matter that you haven't raised the rent in 10 years. You only get to raise it by this year's guideline increase, which in 2021 is zero. And next year will only be 1.2%. So if you sit on it and you don't increase the rent every year, you can't ever get those increases back. Um, so that's why I think it's very important to, to do it every year. Um, even with, with great tenants, it's, it's really just keeping pace with inflation anyway. So it's not like you're doing some mm -hmm. terrible thing to your tenants. And on top of that, um, you know, even these minor little increases, one or 2%, it adds up because of compound interest. So that example we gave earlier of, you know, $1,000 now, maybe in 2022, turns into 1,012. The next year, you can raise that by, let's say the, the rate is 2%. That two percent increase isn't on the initial thousand; it's on the new thousand twelve, and you know you carry that forward ten years, and it really adds up. So, mm -hmm. in my opinion, it's usually a good idea to raise the rent every year. Um, you do it with um, an N one notice of rent increase, um, and you have to give it ninety days in advance. Yeah, it's a relatively simple process and yet so important. I think from like a standard operating procedure or business management because. Like you said, you can't retroactively go back and do that. And where the real implications are, sometimes when, you know, an investor wants to refinance a property, right? And you're trying to debt service the property. And maybe you didn't care necessarily about an extra 10 or $50 a month, but all of a sudden that maybe allows you to carry another $50,000 in borrowed debt or whatever the case may be. It's just, it's so important to understand the big picture here, because again, also when we go to potentially sell that property, Obviously, the new buyer is going to be buying it at much, presumably a much higher price than you likely bought it, which means they're carrying more debt, which means bigger uh, debt payments. And again, all that little bit of additional rent income can help them justify paying that higher price in these competitive markets. So I think it's something that's so easy to overlook and yet is actually really important long term. Yeah, 100 percent. And to your point, you know, for a prospective sale, when you can say, look, the cap rate is 5% or 7% or whatever, because I've raised the rent every year, that's so much more attractive to a buyer than saying, my cap rate is really low, but there's there's mm -hmm. great room for improvement if you get new tenants. It's like, yeah, I, there's no guarantee I'm gonna be able to get a new tenant or kick these tenants out. So yeah, um, yeah, just a, a good rule of thumb to do is, is raise it every year. Um, eviction, so another common call, tragic call that I get is landlords asking me, um, well, I had a one year lease with the tenant um, and I think I under rented it. So I don't want to renew the lease. I'm just going to get them out of there. I'll put a new tenant in and I'll charge fair market rent. And I have to explain to them, no, sadly, that's, that's not how it works. Um, these annual leases, these yearly leases, even if you don't want to renew them, they automatically convert into monthly leases. So you don't have a right as a landlord at the end of a lease to say, the lease is over. You have to leave. I'm putting in someone new. No, that you can't. You can't evict mm -hmm. them for that purpose just because it would be convenient for you. They have every right to stay indefinitely on a month to month basis. So something very important to, to bear in mind. Um, so you don't have an automatic right to evict, but there are circumstances where you, you can evict for other reasons. And today we'll talk about the main one being non-payment of rent. So I'll talk about, I guess, the process involved. Um, and then we can talk about sort of the costs and the timelines and mm -hmm. things like that. But so sort of step one, um, let's say it's the first and your tenant doesn't pay the rent. Um, the very next day, and it has to be the next day, it can't be the same day, but the very next day you should be serving them with an N4, which you can find online. And it specifies that this is a notice uh, to end your tenancy because you haven't paid the rent. And again, this is something that I get pushback 
uh, sometimes from landlords, they say, well, they're only a day late. I, you know, it seems draconian or a bit much to be sending an N4 the very next day, threatening to mm -hmm. evict them. And I say, yeah, um, what you can do is serve it. And before you serve it, send them a text saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to be serving you with an N4. Um, it's just a legal technicality. It's something that I have to do to protect myself. So long as you pay the rent in the next couple of weeks, it's going to be over. You don't have anything to worry about. Just make sure that you pay it. Um, and the reason why it's so important to serve it right away rather than waiting is because, as you know, the eviction process in Ontario heavily mm. geared towards protecting tenants and keeping them in the unit. And so, um, you know, it can be months, if not a year before you actually get an eviction. So if you're waiting that long anyway, why would you wait a month to serve the notice or even a week? It should be the very next day. And if you've got a property manager who's managing your properties for you, you should communicate that as an expectation that, hey, if somebody doesn't pay the rent, the very next day, they should be getting an N4. And I want that to be sort of the standard. Um, so yeah, make sure you serve it the day mm -hmm. after the rent's due. Um, I say here, the termination date is 14 days after you serve. What that means is the tenant has 14 days to pay those arrears. And if they don't, then you can file an L1 application um, basically for a hearing to have them evicted. And so let's, in our example, rent was due on the first. On the second, you served the N4. Um, 14 days after that, uh, so whatever we're on now, like the 17th, you could file your L1 application um, along with your N4 and certificate of service showing that you actually gave your tenant a copy of the N4. Um, and that's what gets you the hearing date. And so because of COVID, um, there was a time where we were seeing a year or more mm -hmm. before you got a hearing date, which is just obscene. Can you imagine having a tenant not paying you any rent for a year while mm -hmm. you are paying uh, your mortgage and potentially your utilities if they're not covered by the tenant? I mean, that's uh, it's just such an injustice in my opinion. But um, mm -hmm. fortunately, that uh, that backlog is being cleared up. It's it's considerably less. It's still way too long, in my opinion. But you're still going to be waiting six months or more, probably, to get your hearing these days. Um, so again, very important that you file yeah. your materials as soon as possible. There's no sense in waiting. You're only prolonging or delaying an already um, overly long process. So that's the next step. You file your application. Um, and now a new, a relatively new thing because of COVID is you have to try to work out a payment arrangement with your tenant. This wasn't always the case. It is now. And it's largely because of COVID and the fact that there were these huge backlogs. And so they tried to come up with some way where they could, you know, put the work onto the landlords and the tenants, mm -hmm. try to clear up all these, um, these hearings because they were just too many, too many people um, not paying rent and not enough support staff at the LTB to handle the, the workflow. So they changed the Residential Tenancies Act and I've got here 83 sub six, basically now says that everyone at the LTB has to consider whether or not the landlord tried to arrange um, a repayment plan with the tenant. And so if you don't, if you just serve your, your notice and you file your application, you show up on the day of the hearing and they say, well, did you negotiate? Did you try to figure out some sort of reasonable payment plan, you say, no, I just filed my paperwork. They'll say, you're out of luck. File again, mm -hmm. see you in eight months. Um, so extremely important that you do try to negotiate with your tenant and that you have something in writing showing that you tried to work out a payment arrangement. And so, um, you know, there's a, a form for this. Um, really all you have to do is send them something in writing saying, hey, you owe me $3,000 in arrears of rent. Um, you obviously have to pay your rent moving forward and on top of your rent, pay me another $200 a month until your arrears have been fully paid or, you know, whatever you want, mm -hmm. you can make the numbers, whatever you want, but just do something, try to do yeah. some sort of negotiated settlement. Um, and then if that doesn't work, if they, um, actually I'll dive a little bit further into that. Sorry, I'm going to pull up some notes here because this is, this is worth talking about. This is potentially something where you can save yourself a lot of time, a lot of hassle. Um, yeah, appreciate it. Because I know this is a dynamic space that has been evolving over the last year, year and a half. And it's important that landlords stay up to date on what's going on. Just because again, it's so easy to think like, well, I did this three years ago, I'll just do it the exact same way. Like, let me pull out yeah. my notes or figure out how it went back then. And uh, the rules constantly are evolving, and we need to stay on top of it. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I should actually preface, you know, this whole conversation by saying, the information I'm providing today is valid as of today. <laughs> but yeah. like you say, it's a constantly evolving ecosphere and 
what we're saying today might not be the case tomorrow, but it is the most relevant information today. Um, so just adding a little bit further into that, that payment um, arrangement, trying to negotiate a payment. So there's a form, formal form online uh, called a payment agreement form. And this um, is actually a great thing for landlords um, because the LTP was so backed up, they came up with this form. And basically if you can get your client or tenant to sign it, saying, okay, you have to pay your rent moving forward and you have to pay arrears of X per month, every month. Importantly, there's a section on that form that says, and you need the, the tenant to initial it. There's a section on that form that says, and if you don't, if you miss a payment, you know, you're supposed to be paying your rent plus arrears every month. If mm -hmm. you miss a payment, I can evict you without notice, um, without letting you know, essentially. And if they tick that box and they put their initials beside it, you're, it, it's so much better for you as a landlord. Because rather than having to wait, like we were talking about, six, eight, however many months to go get your hearing, if you can get them to sign that payment agreement and check the box saying, yeah, you know, that's fair. If I miss a payment, you get to evict me without notice. Um, then all you have to do if they miss a payment is file an L4, a different application, but it's not on notice to the tenant. They don't have to know about it. And you will, instead of having to wait eight months, you'll wait a couple of weeks, maybe, maybe a month to get your eviction order. So mm -hmm. it saves you seven plus months of having to wait. And that's seven plus months of you not getting any rent, still having to make your mortgage payments, your carrying costs. So really worthwhile, not just because you have to in order to succeed at your hearing, but if you're actually able to come to an agreement with your mm -hmm. tenant and get them to fill out the form, uh, if they later you know, fail to comply, you can get them out so much faster. So it's a, it's a great thing for landlords. Um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that perspective. Um, and again, obviously, we can't necessarily compel them to sign or initial any of those agreements. But yeah. for a lot of tenants that, you know, if, if they're saying that they are operating in good faith, it should be a relatively easy conversation for both parties to buy into some sort of new agreement and commit to that agreement being, you know, a strong agreement by initially or signing um, that section as well. Yeah, and you're exactly right. I mean, a professional tenant is going to know not to sign that yeah. form and they're not going to do it. But if you're dealing with someone who's just been having a tough time lately and they have every intention of paying you back, they'll probably agree. And then if they don't, at least you've got way better um, mm -hmm. opportunities as a landlord. Yeah. So if they don't, if they refuse to sign for whatever reason, um, the next steps are at least five days before your hearing, you send an information update form to the LTB and to your tenant. Um, and this information form basically says, hey, from the time that I filled out my application to now, here's what's happened. They owe me even more rent or they paid a little bit, but not the full amount or whatever's happened. It's basically mm -hmm. just updating the LTB so that at the hearing they can see, oh, okay, this is what's been going on. And again, very important that you do file this because if you don't, you will show up to your hearing. They'll say, where's your information update form? You'll say, I didn't, I didn't do it. And they'll say, you're out of luck. See you next time. And you'll start mm -hmm. all over again and potentially wait six to eight months again. So, you know, it's a relatively straightforward process. But if you screw up one little detail, it costs you months and months and months of opportunity costs. So very important to, to follow each step really diligently and, uh, and carefully. Mm -hmm. So you've sent in your information update form. You've given it to the tenants. Now you actually show up at the hearing. Um, at the hearing for this sort of eviction for a non-payment rent, you'd ask for a quote unquote standard order. Um, this isn't anywhere in the Residential Tenancies Act. This is just something that lawyers and paralegals know to ask for and that members um, at the LTB regularly grant, which is an order where the tenant has 11 more days to pay the arrears. And if they fail to do that, you can evict them. Um, so that's what you'd be asking for when you ask for the standard order. Um, mm -hmm. If they still don't pay after those 11 days on day 12, you go to the sheriff, pay a small filing fee of 330, um, and they will go, the sheriff will go and post a notice to vacate telling the tenant, Hey, I'm going to be back in seven days. And usually that, this is where I see people just leave. Um, cause yeah. they know if they don't, a sheriff is physically going to remove them in, in seven days. So unless you're dealing with like a tenants union or something, typically this is when people leave. If they don't, the sheriff does come back. They'll you know, remove the tenant and they'll observe uh, a professional change the locks. So that's the whole process. Uh, kind of from start to finish. There's a bunch of things that can go wrong. Um, tenants can try to be squirrely and um, raise other issues at the hearing. And I, 
I won't dive into that today, but just realize that I'm giving you sort of the Coles notes, mm -hmm. broad overview of, of what usually takes place, but this can go bad in a, in a bunch of different ways. Uh, as far as timelines these days, like I said, the, the eviction, uh, sorry, the hearing backlog is shrinking. It used to be over a year. Now, depending on where you are in the province, um, you can expect to spend at least six to eight months before your eviction is actually carried out because you've got to wait for the sheriff and then you've got to wait for the order from the LTV. There's a lot of waiting around. Um, and bearing in mind this timeline is that worst case scenario, they're not willing to sign an agreement. If mm -hmm. they do sign an agreement and then they breach that agreement, you can evict them very quickly, um, very quickly. Uh, disbursements involved. So this is the money that everyone's got to pay. Whether or yeah. not you get a lawyer or paralegal, everyone has to pay these fees. The current application fees, if you do it over email, sorry, online rather, is $186 for your L1. And then the sheriff's fee, again, this varies, but it's 330 right now. So those are what everyone has to pay. Um, if you choose to have a lawyer or paralegal represent you, obviously I can't speak for other firms, mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you what my firm charges. And I think it's, you know, sort of kind of the going rate out there right now. Um, we would charge a flat rate of 150 plus tax for the notice, 600 plus tax to serve and file the L1, um, and then 400 plus tax to go attend the hearing. And so all in your with tax here, something like $1,300 um, for, for the whole process. Mm -hmm. and so as far as, you know, well, should I hire a, a lawyer, a paralegal? It is a really straightforward process. If you've been through this before and you succeeded uh, and you have a great attention for detail, you probably can do this on your own. And lots of people do. Um, you know, a lot of landlords in Ontario are small mom and pop landlords and they don't want to pay the legal fees. The flip side to that is, is it worth $1,300 for the peace of mind of knowing I'm not going to screw this up. And because if I do screw it up, I could have potentially waste, wasted eight to 10 months. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate because I'm a lawyer and really well versed in the, in the subject matter. But if I was a lay person and someone presented that to me as sort of a risk return kind of situation, I would say $1,300 is nothing. Um, if it's going to save me eight months of lost rent, if I screw up, um, that's obviously I've got a dog in this fight, but that's, mm -hmm. um, that's what I think about it. But again, no legal requirement to do so. You can go, lots of people go to the landlord time board by yourself. If you do go by yourself, just make sure you absolutely triple check every little thing. If you misspell a name, your application gets thrown out. If you carry the decimal too far or you get it 50 cents wrong on the arrears owed, it gets thrown out. If you say 123 Apple Street instead of 123 Apple Street lower unit, it gets thrown out. If you say tenant so-and-so, but you forget to say, and also tenant so-and-so, because there's two tenants, application gets thrown out. So there's just so many ways it can go wrong. So make sure that you really spend your time. It's a very simple, these are like two page forms, super simple. But if, if you don't pay attention to the details, uh, it can just add a lot of time and misery to your life, which I don't want for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Really appreciate that Weston. And just to kind of add my two cents to it as well, obviously it really depends upon the individual landlord, the situation, the context. But I think when we look at the, maybe the cost of hiring a lawyer versus the opportunity cost, if you do screw things up for a lot of us these days, probably one month's rent is going to be similar to the total legal fees associated. So I think yeah. the real key here is if you've got the time and attention to detail and the inclination by all means, I think it makes sense for a DIY or especially a lot of small landlords that want to get their hands dirty and learn the process inside and out. On the flip side, I know these days for me as just like wanting to treat my real estate investing more like a business, you know, I'm focused on the business of becoming an expert at certain pieces of the real estate investing uh, game. And for me, that's really like deal acquisition, finding the, you know, best, highest use of a property. It's not necessarily becoming an expert at navigating the landlord tenant board. And so I, I know that like day one, Matt McKeever would have been super frugal. I definitely did a lot of the stuff myself, but with time, I just realized that there's probably higher, better uses of my time and being able to have it very systematized and just outsourced makes for just a very smooth process. Because one of the biggest frustrations is 
when we start to do these forms ourselves, it can be really easy to start taking an emotional component or stake into the process. We're like, now you're like, I filled out this goddamn form. I've been waiting eight <laughs> months to get this, you know, like, and it starts to become like a hill for us almost where it's like a crusade rather than it should ideally just be another part of the business, right? Where we don't necessarily want to get too emotionally caught up in this because obviously context and situation does matter. But at the end of the day, it is business. And like, I, I just see so many landlords turning these into personal crusades and it ends up spiraling out of control because again, they do forget one little detail. The tenant decides to really take things to the extreme as well. And all of a sudden, like, yeah, it's just, it can turn into such a frustrating process for a lot of landlords that I think what, what the key is, is just, again, if you've got the attention to detail, the inclination, by all means, go do it. But I know these days I'd much rather just outsource it, set it and forget it and go focus and find the next deal. Um, and I think opportunity cost is a big one here when we're talking about those delays. Yeah, a hundred percent. And since we actually, we're, I think we're fairly done, just got one more slide, but um, I'll mention, you know, if we're talking about the wise thing to do, uh, forgetting, like setting aside legal technicalities and I set out sort of the whole process of, of how to do it by the book. Um, at the end of the day, for, for your audience, certainly, this isn't an investment. And so what's the best way of protecting your investment? This is one, one route. If you've got a tenant who's refusing to pay rent and isn't wanting to deal with you, this is really all you can do, legally speaking. Um, mm -hmm. that's something that comes up is, you know, especially in like Facebook groups or things like that, where it's the blind leading the blind. Um, you'll have people saying, well, if it was me, I would just go over there with a baseball bat. <laughs> uh, and, you know, 30 years ago, maybe that was something that actually happened. But now, if you forcibly remove someone without an order mm -hmm. from the LTV, um, they just raised the fines. It's $50,000 for an individual and considerably higher if you're incorporated. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, you know, I know how frustrating it can be for landlords who might be thinking, like, I'm going to lose my home. I, you know, I put so much blood and sweat and time and money into this, and I've got some deadbeat who's bleeding me dry, and there's this temptation to take things into your own hands, and I I empathize, but uh, mm -hmm. to do that, it's one simple phone call for them to call the residential housing enforcement unit. The police will come, they'll let them back in, and you could potentially yeah. face a fine of $50,000. So not worth it in my opinion. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I like just talking here for anyone that's brand new to real estate, I hear so many stories of landlords calling the police thinking the police are going to show up and just like be listen to them and be like oh it's your property we'll do whatever you want sir and it's just like that's really not it never plays out that way it literally never plays out it always plays out with the landlord just being mad at the police because they're not going to um act upon anything there unless there's that sheriff's order so again yeah, yeah it's it's just important to go into this entire process eyes wide open and you do have to follow the paperwork here these days um, when it comes to this. And again, that doesn't mean that there aren't alternatives. You could essentially come to some sort of agreement with the tenant and just have them move out. And oftentimes, again, if it comes to them like sticking their heels in and fighting you or just like everyone walking away clean, again, sometimes that's the fastest, cleanest option. But we really just need to look at the context of the situation. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. So let's let's talk about that because this is sort of a worst case scenario where you've got someone who's not returning your texts, emails, the relationship is yeah. completely broken down and this is your only legal recourse. But oftentimes um, there are other opportunities. And so one of those, which I think you're kind of alluding to is maybe there's a cash for keys type scenario mm -hmm. um, where you can convince them to leave and at least you're getting them out of there. Because if you know, even today when the backlog is smaller, if you know it's going to take at least six, seven, eight months to get them out of there. And that's six, seven, eight months that you're not going to get any rent. Maybe it's worthwhile. I, you know, in principle, you might disagree with it, mm -hmm. but dollars and cents, it might actually make sense to pay them a month of rent or a couple months of rent and get them out of there and clean up the unit and get a new tenant in and start making money again, rather than going through this whole process. So if you want to go that route, if you want to go over the cash for keys route, um, a lot of people screw that up to um, yes. where they'll... <laughs> They'll have, um, for example, the tenant fill out an N9 saying they want to terminate, the tenant wants to terminate the mm -hmm. tenants early. That's a good form for certain situations for what we're talking about, not the right form. You want to send, you want to get them to sign an N11 where both the landlord and the tenant are agreeing to terminate the tenancy. And the benefit of that is um, if you agree to pay them a thousand bucks or whatever, and then they leave at the end of the month and they sign on the dotted line, you sign on the dotted line. If they don't, 
then you can just file an L3. And again, it's far expedited. Um, we're talking a matter of, we just did this, uh, it takes a week, at least in, in Toronto, it took a week. Um, and that's fantastic because you know, you're limiting your downside. You said, okay, you're leaving in a month, I'll pay you a thousand dollars, you're gone. And if, if they then break that agreement, you can get them out in a week rather than waiting six, seven, eight months. Whereas with an N9, um, you could try to file an application, but if there's anything wrong on that form, which again has been filled out by the tenant, so it's probably got something wrong with it, it can be thrown out and you're back to square one. So if you're going to do the cash for keys method, make sure you're using an N11, not mm -hmm. an N9. Um, and that can be a great and cost effective way of removing difficult tenants from, from properties, provided that you can come to some sort of uh, understanding. Yeah, really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, no problem. So last slide, uh, update just what's going on because of COVID. Uh, I'm sure you're aware and a lot of your audience is already aware that for a long time, there were no evictions. There was a moratorium where you might have even had an eviction order, but the sheriff wouldn't actually go to the unit and, mm -hmm. and remove the person. Uh, that was removed earlier this month. Um, the moratorium was lifted earlier this month on June 2nd, meaning right now and probably for the foreseeable future, um, you can enforce your eviction orders. So you actually can go to the sheriff's office and have them come out to the property and, and remove people. Um, another change because of COVID is hearings are now heard remotely rather than having to go to a local um, LTV office. Uh, it's all happening remotely over um, Microsoft Teams, um, similar to, to Zoom. And this is great. Um, this saves landlords uh, a lot of hassle, it saves their counsel and their representatives a lot of mm -hmm. hassle. Um, and this is actually going to be a permanent change. This is, it was implemented because of COVID, but they've put out a press release saying, this is the new normal. This is, this just makes sense. Why haven't we mm -hmm. been doing this for the last 10 years? And I agree. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that's changed because of COVID is um, LTV hearings that are now happening remotely, you know, electronically. Um, they are open to the public. You can ask to attend and, you know, log in and, and view the proceedings. But if you record them, and then disseminate them on you know, Facebook, whatever, um, you can potentially face a $25,000 fine. And the reason that this uh, rule has changed or been implemented is because there were some sort of tenant advocacy groups that would swarm uh, these online proceedings and just sort of shout down the tribunal and they couldn't mm -hmm. do their jobs. And then they would share it all over you know, Facebook or whatever and get a bunch of likes. Um, and I mean, as a lawyer, I think it's important that we do have an open and transparent court system. Um, but even in the old days where you could physically attend a courthouse and superior court, small claims, whatever, even in those courtrooms, you were never allowed to record. You could go and view it for yourself, but you couldn't record it. Um, so I don't think this is that big of a change. I know there's some people that think, oh, this is you know, a gross violation of rights and the government is stepping in. This is really just more of the same. This is how things were before. They're just updating the rules to um, to conform with today's reality, which is everything's happening online. So uh, just be careful of that. Not that I think many people would, but if you attend a hearing, um, if you record it and share it inappropriately, you could potentially face a hefty fine. So just bear that in mind. Yeah, really appreciate that, Weston. And uh, yeah, I, I hadn't actually even heard really too much about the uh, improper recording and stuff. So that's interesting to hear. It, now that you're saying that that sounds inevitable that those sort of shenanigans would have happened. So yeah, yeah. that makes sense. And uh, I guess maybe one last thing here, just when we're on the subject matter of evictions, particularly around uh, non-payment of rent. Uh -huh. And maybe this makes sense for us to explore in a whole separate video, but maybe tying together what we discussed last time and this time, essentially. So let's say I evict the tenant, they're gone, but they still actually owe me a bunch of money. You know, what sort of recourse, what sort of process is there to essentially follow up? Can I still get them their money, get the money from them once I've evicted all that? Yeah. yeah. So um, basically the answer is yes. You can try to go get the money. These hearings, these L1 hearings that we're talking about for non-payment of rent, it's usually for an order evicting and an order that they do in fact owe you all this money that you say they owe you. And so once you have that order, um, a lot of people get confused and they think, okay, well, great, I got them out, but now I want my money. So do I have to go sue them in small claims to get my money? And the answer is no, you've already got the order. You have an order from the LTV mm -hmm. that they have to be evicted or can be evicted and that they owe you say $10,000 in, in past rent. 
once you have that order, you don't have to do the whole process again in small claims. What you do is you enforce it through small claims, which we did kind of touch on in the last video. And there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. You can garnish their wages if you know where they work. Uh, you can um, garnish their bank account if you happen to know the branch address where they do their banking. So TD, Young and McCall or wherever, you'd actually have to know the branch address to garnish their bank account. Um, or if they, unlikely, but if they own real estate, you could also put a lien against their property, which effectively prevents them from refinancing it, selling it, doing anything with it until they pay you back the money that they owe you. So certainly ways to enforce um, some things that you can do if you um, if you're watching the moving truck <laughs> leave uh, and you want to get your money back, it's not a bad idea to go follow that moving truck and find out where they live. Because one of the problems that we face as lawyers is someone will come to us and say, okay, I want to enforce this order. They owe me $10,000. I already have the order from the LTB. I just want you to go get the money. And I'll say, great. Uh, so where do they live? I, I have to serve them some papers. And I was like, I, I don't know. They just, they left. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, you can hire people to do that kind of research for you, but it can be costly and, and unnecessary and sometimes not fruitful. So a better bet is follow the truck uh, <laughs> and find out where do they actually live now? Because when you have to serve them papers to enforce um, your order, you're gonna need to know where they live. So you can get creative with it, but that would be um, one recommendation is at least make sure you know where they're going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really appreciate that Weston and appreciate this entire presentation. Cause I know when it comes to these subject matters, there's just so much fear, uncertainty, doubt from just all kinds of landlords. And I can remember, like, it's even funny just hearing you talk about the N11s versus N9s. Um, I know for years, I always was telling people N11s. And then I want to say like two or three years ago, a couple landlords started saying like, no, it's actually N9s or the like, that's the ticket. And I was like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> and I was like, guys, I think it's still N11s, but I'm not really sure. And then I can remember maybe a year or two ago, one, one or two of those N9s kind of fell apart. And then like, Again, like through the back channels, landlords like, okay, yeah, no, 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 forget the N9s. Those are bad ideas. And it's just like, <laughs> it's just, it's funny because there's so much uncertainty and there is a lot of instances where it's the blind leading the blind or it's someone that got away with something once that they maybe even shouldn't have gotten away with, but it worked out somehow. Or sometimes they misremember the story and that get or the wrong version gets passed along. And again, yeah. it's just so much easier when we actually know what we're dealing with. And that's why having an expert on our power team is just so important so that we can navigate those, you know, the uh, false rumors or the trumors or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's funny. I just saw something online that was blowing up. It was uh, a landlord was sharing that he had hired. Uh, he didn't say hired, but someone had basically fixed his problem where the tenant went out for groceries or something. And this guy working for the landlord changed all the locks, put all that guy's stuff on the lawn. Um, and, and that was it. The person came back and the police were called and um, they said, it's, it's sort of a whole long story, but the point is everyone online was saying like, where can I hire this guy? Uh, <laughs> not realizing like, that's a, that's a one-off. That is a fluke. Um, mm -hmm. You're taking an extraordinary risk in doing something like that. And it's not usually worth it, but uh, it makes for interesting reading for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So a reminder guys, all of Weston's contact information's in the video description down below if you want to reach out. And again, Weston, just because I do know people get nervous talking to lawyers. So like that first initial call, when I'm first just exploring something, do I need to be worried about the minutes that I'm talking here or you'll inform me once you start the clock? Yeah, no, not at all. So how we work um, for almost all things um, is we do a brief phone call. I've got a team of paralegals and law clerks that answer the phones and they'll find out one, if it's even something we can help you with, because we don't do all areas of law. Um, and they'll also run a conflict check and make sure we haven't already acted for that tenant or that landlord and make sure that we actually could act for you if we both wanted to. So we'll do that kind of screening uh, initially. Uh, if it turns out we can help you, you don't have a conflict and we're happy to, to move forward. Next step would be scheduling a consultation. We do charge for our consultations. It's a flat rate, it's 250 plus tax, regardless of the issue. Um, so that would be the next steps. And they're very friendly on the phones. You don't have anything to worry about. Um, yeah, it's a fairly painless process. Yeah, no, just appreciate it because again, sometimes just that fear of the unknown keeps people from reaching out or taking the first step. And again, there's so many of my mistakes are literally just me not reaching out to experts sooner in the process because it just could cost 
a lot less drama, a lot less uncertainty, and a lot less sleepless nights. Because again, sometimes it turns out that all we need to hear is an expert tell us it's not the end of the world, right? Um, That's it's funny you should say that. that almost, I would say 95% of my consultations end with some version of the client saying that, like, oh, thank God, thank you so much. <laughs> I haven't slept in a month. Uh, now I know exactly what I have to do. Thank you. Like, even if I know I have an uphill battle ahead of me, I know what I have to do. I'm ready to go. Um, so yeah, it's actually one of the better parts of the job is helping people get back there normal. Mm -hmm. And so if you guys currently have any questions, if there's any subject matters you'd like for us to explore on a future uh, video, let us know in the uh, comment section down below. We'll definitely happily explore some of your questions. I know, again, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg for a lot of landlords when it comes to their questions around LTB forms, evictions, all that stuff, because there are just so many rumors and back channels for information that uh, sometimes like sometimes it's a half truth. Sometimes it's just complete fabrication. So it's important to understand that guys. And uh, again, just really appreciate Weston. If you guys got value from this video, smash the like button, hit subscribe. If you're new to the channel, and again, all his contact information is in the video description down below. What is up YouTube? Sorry to interrupt, but before you guys wrap up this video, I've got a quick announcement. We've put together a survey where I'd love to get your input on your perspective on what other content should we shoot on this YouTube channel. I've literally made thousands of videos, talked for thousands of hours now about YouTube, and I'm just not always sure what to talk about next. Sometimes it feels like I'm just being a dead horse, but I'd love to hear from you guys. What subjects should we go reapproach? What video should we remake? What subjects have we just completely ignored that like, duh, we need to go make a video about? About that let us know not in the comment section but through this survey and there'll be a link in the video description down below thanks guys i'll see you in the next video